Hello, 40 Waters. Longtime listeners of the show will know that I'm a big believer in education, especially music education, and I'm excited to announce that this episode is brought to you by Truefire. I've partnered with Truefire to bring you an opportunity to get into their lessons at an affordable rate in a way that's going to help you help the podcast and get you playing more guitar. I'm excited to say that you can use the code 40WATT, 40WATT, at checkout to get 40% off your first or next purchase through Truefire. That includes their all access pass to have access to all of their lessons and videos and jams. I highly recommend it. I use it myself. I'm a huge fan. I truly believe in Truefire's motto of live, practice, and play. Please use the link below to get started and happy learning. All right, 40 Waters, welcome back. This is season two, episode nine. I know it's been a minute since the last episode. Thank you all for your incredible patience. Um, I got super busy with my uh, day job. Those of you that uh, have been listening to the podcast for a while, you know I am a public library director. Uh, we had a major fundraiser. It stole two weeks of my life that I just, there was no way I could do anything else. And then I had a blues festival. And then, I, you know, to almost two and a half years, it was too long. I had to try the COVID thing. <laughs> and uh, 100%, 10 of 10, do not recommend. Mm-mm. Don't do it. Don't, it. It sucks. And so it has knocked me out. So if I sound a little bassier to you today, that is why. Um, but we're going to get right into it. Uh, so happy to have on the podcast. Actually, we've been talking for a little while now by getting this episode to happen. And, you know, schedules are crazy. And then mine got crazier with getting sick. But uh, got Spencer Law from Mike Law Custom Guitars. What's up? Welcome to the show. Thanks so for having you? me, man. Yeah, absolutely. So, Spencer, we're going to do the thing where um, we're going to do the We're going to do the backup. We're going to start how you get in, got into music. How'd you get into guitars? Uh, how'd you get into the the building? Which, you know, I know part of this is going to be a fun story. I mean, yeah. the, the name of the company and your name ought to give it away a little bit, but yeah, um, <laughs> just a little so, bit the last names. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's do that. How's the story? How'd you get into all this? So I, so, okay. I'm going to back up real to the beginning. Um, I was born 100% into a musical family. I was very, very lucky. Um, my father uh, was Mike Lull um, of Mike Lull's Custom Guitars. And my mom uh, actually started the business with, with my dad. Um, and they totally were playing music all the time when I was growing up. They were singing. Um, my dad was a bass player, played a little bit of guitar, but mainly like his role was the bass player. Uh, my mom was guitar flute singing they both had really really great voices my mom still has a great voice um and so i we were i just grew up all around music and i remember i always wanted to play guitar um and bass and at the time you know i was i'm still not super tall or big or anything i'm like five eight and a half on a good day but uh i i was really short until i was like maybe 13 and I hit like my first growth spurt. I was like four, nine uh, all until that point. So you can imagine my, um, you know, middle school, uh, days, <laughs> it was like, shoink. um, and basically I, I wanted to play guitar that whole time. And my dad didn't want me to like try a losing game of my hands were small. I didn't really like, I couldn't grip the guitar super well. So I played piano and that was fun but I really wanted to rock. And finally uh, I convinced my dad to get me a guitar. I'm like, no, I won't just quit if it's tough. I promise. I really, really want to play. Cause I just grew up all around it, you know? Yeah. And I started playing. I remember I saw a uh, live uh, shot concert of journey, the escape tour uh, that we just had at the house or something. We had like the crossroads DVDs and there was, oh, yeah. I used to watch them all the time. And, a bunch of live music DVDs, Foreigner, Boston DVDs, all this stuff. And then I saw Neil Schoen just like shredding it up, going crazy on uh, some Journey stuff. And it totally made me want to, uh, I was like, I want to shred like that. Like I want to be able to, there you go, man. Boom. 
Yeah, for and, those of you who uh, can't see, I've actually got those Crossroads DVDs right here next to my desk. Those are, it's gold, man. Yeah. Um, thank you, Eric Clapton. And so it's, uh, so I started kind of just really wanting to be a shredder at first uh, to be cool. I mean, who doesn't want to be like the cool kid in high school who can like do the Marty Fly thing and just like shred and <laughs> you know, that's what I wanted to do. And over time, tastes got refined and um I remember my mom used to tell me when we were, when I was trying to shred and do like 8,000 notes per second, she's like, Spence, Spence, just remember something. She's like, simplicity, like melody, simplicity. A lot of notes is really cool, but, mm -hmm. and that's totally cool. You can do that. But just remember that like simplicity communicates. It really yes. hits deep in the listener. And of course, at the time I'm like 14, raging hormones, wanting to like, rock my freaking world i'm like yeah, yeah yeah mom cool 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 that sounds great <laughs> but uh but it really that lesson i still think about it to this day when i'm doing demos for the for you know our instruments and when i'm just playing with my family and my friends and stuff and it's uh i will when i'm like when i go in for a solo i'm like okay like give it space let yeah. the notes breathe you know sustain some stuff um yeah anyways that's the very short version of course uh to how i kind of got started in in music in general yeah. so i kind of was already always around how you know when i grew up and always had it in my life i didn't think of not playing music it's just it was a matter of how can i play like we had a music we have a music room still at, at our house and um, my mom's house and I go over there all the time and, and play and we sing, you know, and Jackson Brown stuff and um, Neil Young and, and uh, you know, Simon Garfunkel, all, all that stuff. Like we, yeah, we love that awesome. kind of music. And um, yeah, that's, there's a, there's a good answer to that question. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and it's funny you talk about the whole million notes a second thing I recently bought and I'm, I'm working on a YouTube video for it as soon as, I can talk for five or 10 minutes without <laughs> coughing. Um, I recently bought one of the, uh, uh, the Schecter Sun Valley shredders. It, yeah. I, maybe. I had, I had some guitar center credit, you know, cause I, I use my gear card. This, I'm not going to shill for a guitar center, but if you're going to buy things, get the gear card, get the points. Get, you mm -hmm. may as well get some money back on the stuff you're going to buy anyway. Totally. Um, but, uh, so I had this credit I needed to spend, and it was marked down real low. I like, I think I paid like a hundred and fifty bucks out of pocket for it, and I was like, <laughs> I I didn't have anything with the Floyd Rose anymore because like, all right, you I gotta have do one. Shred. Yeah, you gotta have one. Like yeah. my first guitar had a Floyd Rose, oh, and I gosh. swore I'd never do it again. I swore I'd never do it again. Well, now I've done it again, but you gotta get that shred on. You know, you you have do to that. Man, until you have to change the strings, and you're like, okay, I don't want to. Floyd Rose guitar anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I've already done it because it came. Well, I put fresh nines on it because that's okay. your a shredder. You're supposed to have nines, right? You I'm, have to. I'm a, he, I'm a heavier gauge player, and so I'm like, and so I'm like bending and like, oops, that was like a step and three quarter. That sounds <laughs> awful. Going double whole steps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like no, this sounds <laughs> awful. But uh, I, I've got a friend of mine, uh, Marshall Drew, who is I, I grew up. I would say grew up. I didn't start playing guitar until I was already technically an adult. I was 18, seven, maybe been 17. It was my senior year of high school. Um, and I'd jam with him and we'd play. And he was really into the stuff that I got into later. And he was mm. like, and he was also the guy who like really got me into like Miles Davis and Coltrane and like nice. the idea that the shredding thing is fun and there's a place for it. Right. But when you're when you're connecting and you think of the instrument more as a mel melodic voice yeah. remember that horns and singers can only play when they're breathing out yes and so suddenly i started to try to do that as a guitar player only play when i'm breathing out and like i i put my breathing into my playing it's wild now yeah. do i still overplay and play too many <laughs> notes and do that kind of thing yeah hell of yeah, course I do. not man you never <laughs> overplay as a guitar player no never. i i'm the same way like i um of course, when you first start playing guitar, I, I wanted to impress everybody. I wanted, you know, I learned like the Stairway to Heaven solo. And I remember like playing it for my older brother who, uh, he's a great singer, great guitar player. Um, you know, he's mainly like 
singer songwriter kind of like cool learn the chords sing the song kind of stuff and that's that's not a diss yeah. towards uh you know my bro harrison i love you man but um and he would admit that he he's m more like cool as a utility to be able to sing and uh so i remember being the younger brother i have three brothers i'm the second oldest and um trying to be like okay i'm gonna be better at guitar than my older brother like i'm gonna play better so i learned that stairway to heaven solo it was like the first solo that i learned i was just like i'm gonna learn this and he came home after school and I'm like, you know, piecing it together. And I think I had it like 80% there. And he's like, is that you playing, bro? Was that you? I'm like, yeah, dude, like it's, it's not a big deal. Like whatever, it's fine, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it totally like validated my desire to want to be this like shredder because my older brother thought I was cool. And of course, you know, we might not want to admit it, but as the younger brother, you want, like, you look up to your older bro. So I was like, oh, he yeah, thinks he's cool. Like, I want to be cool like him. And, and uh, so then after that, you know, then came all the, okay, trying to learn some of the Eagle stuff and some Joe Walsh stuff, which is not crazy complicated stuff, no. but it's so groovy and like, it's in the freaking pocket and you play the, the notes and you're like, this just, it makes you feel things. So now whenever I play, I really, I try to imagine that I'm communicating to someone when I play. I'm not just in my zone of like, you know, and sometimes I get that way. Like I'm at home and I have my loop pedal going. I'm like, let's try some crazy shit. Let's just like, yeah. and does that tap thing work? And I'm like, oh, it, it did. That's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, I can pull that out maybe never, ever in a demo or whatever, but I'll try um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. Just, I think that's what makes guitar and bass and, but really just music so great and such a great escape for, for myself and for others, uh, is it's, you never stop trying something new. You never try, you know, and, and if you do, you don't really play anymore after that. And yeah. so as long as you're serious in it, you're, you're always learning something and, uh, you know, my little brother, um, you know, he's, I call him my baby bro, but he's 21, turns 22 this <laughs> month. Um, he, uh, he's been playing now for, I think a year or so. He's always kind of played and dabbled, but he's really like, cool. I'm going to actually start learning how to really, really play. And he'll even see me sometimes. He's like, dude, how do you like, how do you do that? What, what did you do there? Like, how did yeah. you make that work? And I'm like, wax on wax off first like <laughs> there's a whole bunch of steps between there's here a couple and there. steps man and that's the cool thing about it is it's never it never ends which as long as you look at it as an inspiring fact not yeah. just like watching Mateus asado and going oh well i'm gonna quit like that's cool you know oh god <laughs> i do i do that when i watch like yvette young too and her tapping oh technique and i'm like oh my gosh it makes I want to be able to do that so bad. And I've been working on it, but I so can't. Oh. Dude, some of that, <laughs> I'm like, still like legato, many years away from it. The double stop yeah. legato stuff where he's like, woo, woo, woo. I'm like, yeah. how do you know in your head that you're connecting all those notes in that polyrhythmic fashion? Like I can do you don't. some that, little, at that point. That's feel. Yeah, I know it, it's feel. That, and uh, It's just amazing, dude. I love that. Yeah. Guy. Well, it's funny because like guitar is, it's that thing that, you know, sure, you can pick up a guitar and in a few months, weeks even, you could be playing songs. You can. You oh, can yeah. do it. Heck, I taught my wife a couple of chords once and she was already playing songs in one day. I'm glad she didn't really get interested in it. She'd be way better than me. Yeah. Um, but I'm secretly uh, afraid she, of that as well. Uh, my yeah. wife, I taught her like a chord and I'm like, you need to get a better teacher than me because I'm not the best like teacher in the world. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I play it like this. Like, this is what I do. She, she, I'm like, you need to get a better I, teacher. And I'm like, shit, she's going to get, she's way better than me at everything else. So I'm like, she's going <laughs> to definitely get better than me at guitar. If she really did. Oh yeah. To it. Oh yeah. And I used to, I used to teach guitar lessons back in the day. Actually, actually the highest tier of my Patreon, by the way, listeners, if you want to support the podcast, you can go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast at the highest tier of my Patreon. I'll do monthly lessons. Dude, that's uh, awesome. Still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's anything. I'll, I'll teach everything from keys to music theory to guitar, bass, whatever. We'll, we'll do. If you really want me to teach drums, I'll do it. But um, I like teaching. 
Um, but yeah, she picked up a guitar. I taught her three chords. She immediately, immediately started strumming out a song and knew what song she was playing and played the rhythm to it perfect she's also do you ever you ever play hurdle it's like wordle but it's songs it's sort of like yeah. name that tune yeah and she gets it in one second every time oh my god because she she's got that musical memory in her ear way better than i do as the guitar player like she <laughs> of course she knows the intro of a song instantly she also makes fun of me when i'm playing like a gig last night she wasn't she wasn't there she was she was at home but uh, she makes fun of me because she's the only one who realizes when I forget the lyrics to a song and I make them up on the spot. <laughs> Nobody else is listening that hard, but she's like, you have sung this song for 10 years and you still don't know the lyrics. <laughs> Dude, I, was like, I yeah. literally, it's so funny you say that because my wife is the same way. Like there's songs like I write and I'm singing them and I'm like, I know I've sung them for her before. I'm like, wait, shit. Like, what was that? And she's like, the line is blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, thank you. I'm like, how do I wrote it? Like, I freaking wrote this. How do I not remember the lyrics? Uh, and she can't. So, you know, that's why I'm terrified to teach her any guitar. Because she will get better than me, for sure. Yeah. She'll destroy yeah, any same. ego I have. It'll just, it's gone. Same. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it for me, um, my, my sister, I'll, for, I'll bring this up. Actually, uh, one of the ways I really became... Uh, we're gonna get into the instruments y'all make. Oh, nice! Um, yeah. One of the ways I really became became familiar with uh, the the guitars and basses y'all make is because my friend Cody Killens, who is yes. uh, a lull artist, uh, actually he gigged with me. He was on bass with me last night at my nice. gig. Nice. Uh, yeah, and so it we was great Cody. hanging He's out with Cody. Dude. Oh, and what a killer player, monster player. Bring um, up. I, I I can't throw any and and last night was definitely a throwing spaghetti at it because it was oh it was wild that like. Because I was sick, I didn't know what my voice was going to be like, so it was hard for me to make the set list for this four-hour gig. Oh my and gosh. and then my drummer contacts me on Tuesday and says, "Hey, dude, I guess it was my turn to get COVID." And I'm like, "Oh, so my sister, who is the most talented person I know, I, I by I, by a long shot, um, she's a great singer, songwriter, guitarist, wow. uh, drummer." So she normally plays guitar with me as a four piece. So we're doing yeah. this, you know, two guitars, bass, drums. So I'm like, hey, Jacqueline, you're on drums tonight. <laughs> She's like, OK, let's go. So it was this totally like, well, I'm used to not rehearsing, but it's this unrehearsed. We're just picking songs as I figure out what we're going to play kind of thing. Fly by the seat of our pants. Uh, just follow me for when guitar solos happen because I don't know they're gonna happen. Jeez. And uh, I could I could not stress Cody out. It's not possible. The dude, dude. Just flows. He's so good. He's such a. So, I mean, he's such a wonderful, chill dude. At the same time, like he's such a great yeah. human being. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's he's he's been um, playing our stuff for quite a while now. And and I was like, I think it was last year, maybe beginning of last year or something. I was like, dude, you know, it, for us, um, like, hopefully this goes, I'm, I'm sure this, I'll just say it. It's kind of confidential, but I, I'll say it. I <laughs> like giving, uh, you know, I like giving a, a good price to a professional musician, like someone who's actually, um, you know, trying to make a living playing music because yeah. my dad was a professional musician. That's how, and really, I mean, to get into the instruments, that's how my dad started this company is he was trying to solve problems for everyday musicians. He was a everyday gigging musician um, as a bassist in classic rock bands. I mean, that was his, his whole thing growing up. And he was looking at it going, you know, why does this feel better than this one? Why does this yeah. one, you know, sound better than this one? And all the little things that you know, hey, if I throw a 0.022 microfarad cap on it versus a 0.047, like, what's that going to do? Is it going to change the like uh, into all the tone or is it just going to be only when I'm using the tone knob? All that kind of stuff. And so he essentially, he was a professional musician himself, working the scene locally right. in, in the Pacific Northwest, gigging every night and repairing instruments and kind of building stuff on the side, but not really under a people who bought them knew it was like, Hey, Mike built this, but this is like, we're talking late seventies, early eighties. Um, and it wasn't really a brand at that point. It was just like, Hey, he knows how I like, you know, how I like my setups and how I like a neck to feel on, you know, my Fender jazz. I'm going to give it to him and he'll carve it. And 
whatever, you know, or use a warmeth neck and, and shave it down to, to my liking and assemble it and all that stuff, shield it, all that. Um, so the reason why I even mentioned that is for us, a big part of our company, like, yeah, like I love Brian Beller, super, super awesome friend and musician, incredible, incredible bass player, you know, Satriani and the clock and Vi and all that stuff. Yeah. Ridiculous bassist, you know, and this is not a diss towards Brian, of course, but like, in fact, there's one of his signature models right there, yeah. BBMF5, <laughs> the, the green one, I think. We just did a, a uh, yeah. hopefully it's not in mirror mode. Anyways, um, dark no, no, it looks, green. It look, looks right to me. We'll, we'll see when I download the video. Right, <laughs> right. But uh, the reason I say that is like, the, the guys that keep the actual, and this is true for any guitar company, by the way, people who say otherwise, yeah like need to check themselves. The people that actually pay the bills are everyday people. And a lot of them are professional musicians that are, you know, and, and I didn't mean to sing about Brian, like that goes for all of our, our oh, artists sure. that are bigger names, you know? Um, I love Jeff Lament and I love Tom Peterson. And, you know, these guys are awesome, great friends of mine. And uh, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful humans. But, um, there's also a special place in my heart and there was a special place in my dad's heart for the guys going and gigging every night or, you know, two nights a week or whatever. And they're, they're out there making music in a professional setting in their local scenes. And uh, so the reason I even say any of that is I looked at, I'm like, Cody's owned like a dozen of our instruments. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> like he's owned so many of them and he was coming with an idea for another custom order. And I'm like, I, I consider him, uh, you know, an endorsing artist. Like I want to, like, he's played our stuff nonstop for a decade plus. He should, he should have an artist deal with us, you know? So anyways, that's a little backstory on Cody and then you're, you're great, well, bud. Yeah. You're gigging with. Well, I, I like the, I like the idea of that too, because not, especially with Cody, you know, not, you know, I can't really speak to a lot of the other endorsed artists y'all have, cause I don't know them personally. Like I know Cody, but you got right. a guy like Cody who's incredibly talented, who has played some of the Nashville scene, but still yeah. is just a, you know, a local scene guy. Not only though, is he a gigging every chance he can bassist, He's a music educator. He's a band director. And totally. so once again, once again, you're seeing students coming up and sure, most of them are horn and percussion players, but a lot of them, those in that band end up taking up guitar or bass later. So it's, it's, you know, from a business side, you're just making, you know, putting it into dollars and cents, just being, we're being real, real frank. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole legion of up and coming guitar players who are seeing their band director play your instrument right and and sure. so they they're familiar with it at that point too it's it it makes perfect sense it's supporting a guy who supports you who's out there yeah. doing the work and also it's it's just good marketing. and as it's cheesy as this sounds but i really believe it to like the core of my being like people who are out there making music you it's it's not just the guys that are at the tip 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 top like no people out there that are going and making music and Con they're, they're contributing something really, really massive to society. Like, I truly believe that. I don't think, you know, I think without music, the last two years, and we technically kind of didn't have music for two and a half years with yeah. all this crazy stuff going on. But, um, like, without music, this whole last two years would have been like, all right, it's, it's freaking over, man. Like, this is, it yeah. wouldn't even be worth it, you know? Um, but, I think music makes life better for everybody. Uh, you don't have to like, I was watching this um, thing that Victor Wooten was on like, a little interview that he was doing. And he's like, it's a universal language. You don't have to know anything about it to get it. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, you don't have to speak the language to get it. And I'm like, dude, it's so true. Like you don't have to be some Juilliard, you know, uh, graduate or some Berkeley, you know, free guitar player to get when someone's like grooving and you're like, Whoa, and you're feeling it and it's, and it's yeah. going on, you know? So I like supporting well, that. Uh, my dad loves supporting that. And it's something that we really feel is important. Um, there are, and this is not a dig on other companies. There are strategies in other companies that are like, you know, they have their top of the top and it's like, 
you know, focusing on that really hard because you have the younger generation coming up going, I want to play like this person. They idolize this person, this player. Right. Nothing wrong with that at all, by the way. But, um, you know, it, it's about everyday musicians too. So, um, yeah, hopefully that doesn't sound so snake oil salesman-y, but it's, it's, it's true for me, you know? Well, no, and, and, you know, I've talked with different, uh, different other brands and companies on this podcast about just, uh, not just marketing, but supporting the community and getting into it. And, and you've got your, I'm not going to throw any company under the bus, but we know the ones that aren't that great at marketing right now. Right. Like I want to speculate on what they were doing and it's a brand I love. I'm, I'm going to be real honest. It's a brand I love, but what the hell are you doing? Um, Anyway, I'm going to digress. Uh, in YouTube, if you want to speculate on what company I'm talking about, go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, but it, it's those companies that are really um, – in, in this is where I'm going to look at a company like Fender and say, hey, it's a company that's realizing they, they, they need to do something different. Uh, yeah. I look at um, when – like some of the signature models they're putting out right now, like the Her signature model. like. Yeah what i had never even heard of her before that signature model came out and that's how i got into them i was like right. well, i got into her um yeah. but and so it's great to see because there's a lot more of those local artists and local musicians making money even if it's not their principal living because let's right. be honest even a lot of national touring bands when they go home, they still have to have another job to yeah. make ends meet because they're oh, not yeah. making a living touring. It's not the same as it was like, you know, 70s, 80s, where it's like you got a record deal and then you're set for your whole life. There's also right. so many more musicians now, which it's kind of funny. Like I have an interesting view on this. I And I hopefully I don't offend anybody with my view, but I think that um, it kind of allows people the freedom to also – listen to who they want to listen to and it allows the artists the freedom to do what they want to do and create what they want to create. And if it, right. if it just so happens to be in some niche, you know, you can like totally, totally narrow cast your, your niche and go hard into that thing and, you know, have a professional career going after yep. that niche. And it doesn't have to be the top 40, uh, Justin Bieber thing going on like you and no shade on Justin man. I mean whatever right. even him he's got to built a great career for himself I'm just like you don't have to do that and that's the what right. I think is really cool with music uh right now and just musicianship in general is there's there is really no limit and there's bands that are out there that have really really tight-knit followings and they're just playing getting to play music full-time which is really cool yeah. for them um and then there's the guys that have the day job and also create music. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those guys generally get to go buy whatever the frick they want anyways, because they yeah. have a job supporting, not just like, cool, I'm, I am like struggling city to city. I have $10 to go uh, eat a McDouble, you know, and then yeah. move on. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, the I guys can maybe that, afford strings this trip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, like, there's think. no shame in having a day job. In fact, I think the term is kind of, it's almost like it has a negative kind of, Oh, they have a day job. Like mm, they have it. Mm, right. Have it. It's like, like it negates their art or even their music. Cause that, that's the other thing is like, I, I see the sometimes shade cast upon like people who play in cover bands and I'm like, <laughs> they're, they're filling a need too. They Dude. are they're They are no less a musician than anyone Absolutely else. Not. You know, Dude, I totally, do and like to go into a little bit of this, like, you know, we have the repair shop as well, um, where we service the community. And that was a really, really big part of my dad's vision for not just building, you know, boutique high level, um, you know, custom instruments, guitars and basses, but also being able to really help local musicians and people ship stuff to us from all over the world too. It's kind of crazy, but like dial things in, like we have a, we have a plaque machine. Um, we're the only ones within... <coughs> I think like a thousand miles and the closest one next to us is San Francisco, Barry Brower down there. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, people will bring things in and like, we like to set things up and help people like make their guitars play better. Like I was just working on a, on a silver sky today. Like I had somebody bring in 
uh, Silver Sky, and he's like, you know, it's just a little, like, there's this going on and that going on. And I look at him, I'm like, okay, cool. I know the guy's playing preference. I know what he tries to do. I know the, he's, he's obviously a John Mayer fan. I know what he's trying <laughs> to, you know, what he's trying to accomplish. And I'm like, okay, well, the action's too high. You know, it's, the intonation's a little off over here and here. Uh, you know, Nut needs to come down a little bit on these two spots. And we dialed it in and he's like, oh my gosh, he just texted me like 20 minutes ago. He's like, geez, dude, like, this is so much better. That brings me joy too. You know, of course I love when, when people buy one of our instruments and I love that it supports not just us and, and my employees and being able to, you know, keep everything going, but there's also something special about just dialing in a setup on somebody else's instrument. And they're like, dude, making it play a way that they didn't think it could ever play. And then plucking something too. I mean, that, that's huge, by the way. Like, I don't know if anyone that, that process that process has changed a lot. It, so, um, I I I always do my own setups. I've always done all my own setups until yeah. I I do all my own work until it involves fret work, and then yeah. I'm like, this is where I'm going to go to a professional because you can't mess that up. I, yeah, I, I learned I learned a long time ago that frets are a lot like mixing drinks. You can always yes. put more alcohol in, but you can't take it out. <laughs> you can you can always take more fret off. You can't put it back once you yes. go to a certain point. And it comes so, out in a really unpleasant way if you if yes, you mess that yes. up. Yes. <laughs> so, but it's, the Plex machine. So I um I have a Novo. Uh, that yes. I, I bought in 2020. I ordered in 2020. Got it in January 2021 before their Neat. wait list got. Super crazy. long. I think they crazy. Just, just increased it to eighteen months. Those guys are um, awesome, by the way. Super sweet guys. Oh, um, oh yeah, great, yeah. I had a I had a Saris uh, P two for a little bit. Yeah, awesome, awesome yeah. guitar. Yeah, yeah. I pull, I've got a I've got a Saris J, and I love that. And it's plecked. And yeah. I also recently picked up. I had him on the podcast. I realize I'm talking about other makers who <laughs> I don't right. have one of your guitars yet. It'll happen eventually. Um, <laughs> but I, I I bought a a Cower Banshee, yeah. which is also plecked. And there is a, I know some people don't like it. They're like, oh, it's a machine doing the thing. It, yeah, it's a machine doing the thing because yeah. it can be more precise than we can. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> you this. You know? It's so funny. Okay, so hopefully nobody gets, someone will get offended by me saying this. And I'll just, I'll take Someone it. gets offended by everything. So. Yeah, no, it's, I can't be everyone's favorite. Uh, but I'll, I'll say this. Like I had a guy come in the shop, in the showroom, uh, maybe six months ago and he picked up a uh we had a p4 on the wall which is you know our version of let's see if i have one oh yeah i'll grab it you know it's our version of a very well-known <laughs> bass right sure. i don't know if this looks familiar to anybody um yeah but the design right and for, for those for those of you just listening to the audio podcast it it looks like a lot like a company's bass that rhymes with bender and a single letter designation yes so so <laughs> there we go and you know he picked one off the wall and he goes he goes yeah so like do you you know are these handmade because he knew that they were not the most inexpensive uh instruments around right and i was like i mean there's definitely a lot of hand work that goes into it, but no we, we see and see our our bodies yeah. and, and necks and he's like oh and i'm like what do you mean by that <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean by that, man? I didn't like jump on him or get like defensive. I'm just like, yeah, curious why that why that bothers you. And he goes, well, you know, anything he goes anything above three thousand dollars should be, uh, you know, handcrafted. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Oh my gosh. I was like, let's say, like when when you know a brand, and you know that you want to buy that thing, and it's very very well known, or it's like it's a dream of yours to own that instrument. And that instrument is, is, I mean, it's a great instrument. Do you want to have any qualms or any sort of doubt on that? It's going to be the exact instrument that you're going to purchase, like that you want, have wanted to purchase for a long time. And he's like, no, of course not. I want it to be, I'm like, you want it totally consistent. Yes. And he's like, yes. I'm like, that's down to the neck profile. That's down to the fretboard radius. That's down to, and that's a, a lot of that can also, you know, that gets worked by hand as well. But, you know, of course. you get what I'm saying. I'm like, that neck heel carve, the way that it feels, like we have a, a very exact um, 
carve that we do on the back of our necks that you can kind of see uh -huh. it right in there where it helps with the upper fret access and it's it just really is super smooth so when it hits the body it it guides with the hand and follows the hand and it makes it feel like you're not going up into that upper register that's on the guitars and the basses yeah. and um just helps with the, with the access and and he's like yeah and i go we make sure that we can achieve that exact same result every time by using CNC, you know, manufacturing. Um, you know, then the finesse work comes in because I think people have this connotation like a Plex machine or a CNC machine, just like you press a button and there's no artisan work that goes oh, yeah. into it. It's Dude, not true at all. If you, if I told anybody how much labor goes into making one of our necks feel the way that one of our necks feels, and that's going to sound really cocky, but it's one of the things that I'm really, really proud of. Um, they wouldn't believe me. I mean, I could tell somebody, yeah, you know, it takes X number of hours to get that just buttery feel where the fret ends, yeah. there's nothing sticking out. They're super, they're shiny, they're polished, they're are smooth, the chamfer's perfectly dialed in, so there's just, you don't feel any sort of resistance as you're going up and down the neck. You know, the fretboard edges are rolled very specifically, like ridiculously specifically. Um, you know, the the bone nut, the done by hand, that's one thing that we don't see in C, because you can't really yeah. see in C bone. Um, no. But, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And not to go on a whole rant here, but, um, but yeah, we we've, we've been the Plex machine helps us to achieve super super consistent to a thousandth of a millimeter perfection on exactly on fret leveling and it dials in things that an eye could never see. It's funny like when we got my my dad was one of the first uh, kind of endorsers or adoptees of of a Plex. We've owned the Plex here for four. 15 years i think now 2008 oh wow that's really early that's it's really, really early, early so we have the old, we have the it's the same new software and every we have the big machine yeah. right um and i remember when my dad got it and there was a couple i won't mention names but there was there was a couple other like contemporaries in his space that are like oh like lull needs a a plec to get it dialed and i had seen some of the forums online and i was like here i am like the sun, I'm like 17 or 18 at the time. And I'm like, people are like, you know, harping on my dad for like <laughs> having this machine. And I asked my, I asked him, I'm like, dad, why did you buy this machine? You do really good hand prep work. Why, why did you buy it? And he goes, cause it does it better than anyone can, like any human can. And he goes, and like, it saves, like, I don't have to have double carpal tunnel surgery for, yeah. you know, hand fret leveling for 30 years. Like my master Luthier, who's been here since before I was born, he's had double carpal tunnel because 30 years of, I mean, this and yep. this, like, so anybody who's complaining about like, oh, it was done on a machine, not by like artists. And I'm like, think of your Luthier's hands, bro. Like think of, yeah. think of them too. Like they don't have to slave away for your pleasure. And, it does it better <laughs> than any, like, it's demonstrable. You know, you can, you can put any guitar in there and it is unforgiving. I mean, that's how we yep. learned our lesson on it too. Is like, that's a good fret job. Like that's perfect. It's amazing. And then you put in the plaque and the plaque don't lie. It's like, Hey, this is off. This is off. This is where it's <laughs> off. And you're like, Oh shit. Like, I guess, you know, that's not as perfect. There's been some really, really nice instruments that we've had in here. And again, I, I won't throw shade, but you know, some really, yeah. really nice instruments that the person's like, I just bought this, it's perfect. Do you mind scanning it and just seeing, you know, if, if it's dialed and it looks good. And we scan and we're like, it needs, it needs a little bit of love. You know, like there's, this is not where it needs to be. And then we correct it. So that's, that's the beauty of it. Like as long as you don't have a big, huge ego to protect associated with it, then, then it's great. And it allows us to achieve a standard playability that we know and love and our customers know and love. And it's uh, like, we know how we like our next set. We know how we like our action set out of the, you know, factory or shop, you know? Sure. Um, and 
consistency so that I know I can send that guitar to somebody and they're going to play it and go, this feels like a lull. And I'm sure like right. the Novo, you, you know, the Novos that you own, <laughs> same thing. I'm sure that Matt and, uh, and Dennis were looking at that going like, this is going to make it so we can achieve a super consistent end product that exactly at some point when you get big enough in the market, you have to have that. Like people expect that of, of a brand. Um, the more low volume, super boutique you go, the more that people kind of, they go, okay, I know that there might be a consistency thing here or there because it's, you know, generally one person building from scratch and they, they always, you know, make it right, generally speaking, but it's, it's the bigger you get, the more notoriety you get, the more expectation that it's like that thing has to be perfect. It has to be. And every one of them has to be perfect. You can't have any, like, like, like I'll tell you for us, like before anything goes in the showroom, I sit there and I play it. And if I don't want to take that instrument home and make it my own, it doesn't go in the showroom. Like that's right. literally my test for my, I'm the final, final, final quality point of like, you know, I don't make the, the instruments myself. I'm not a, a personal, like I don't, I'm not the master luthier here. I have an amazing, amazing team that's been doing it for much longer than I have. Um, I do all the business stuff and which is, you know, all the awesome fun business stuff, like getting to be on podcasts like this and all the yeah. super not sexy business stuff, like inventory and taxes <laughs> and uh, stuff that you're like, that's not sexy to talk about, but Hey, it needs to get done. And uh, you know, drawing up lists, like, you know, dealer price lists and all that stuff. So um, sourcing materials. Oh my gosh, man. Oh my gosh. That's yes. Yeah. Like right that. now that's a major train wreck. Like that's dude, we had like one, uh, man, I could talk for hours about that, but 2020, if anything that the last two years has taught us, it's like, Hey, you need to learn how to adapt like that and keep the yes. same quality. Like I discovered that, you know, like we use Fralin uh, pickups, like for a lot of our instruments, uh, Lindy's dear friend, been make we've been using him for i mean long long yeah. time and I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of fraylin he's he's one of those early boutique pickup makers who between between him and a lot of people still don't think of seymour duncan in the same boutique but you gotta dude. remember there was a time when seymour duncan was he was it dude. i realized that was it and dude. him and jason lawler those three to me are like they started the pickup dude. craze absolutely like i'll show you like um <clears throat> I'll just grab one of these. This is a uh, one of my personal. I have actually, believe it or not, all these instruments in the showroom, like that you're looking at, these are actually sold. They're not. Um, they're not available. But I just was like, I need to have stuff in here for people to play. Otherwise, it'll sure. be a problem. And uh, so, like these are Seymour Duncans that were developed with my dad and Seymour back in the late '90s. Oh and wow, they're that's a cool. Very specific wind that uh you know we use for all it's the standard pickup in our five strings and uh -huh. they're bright they're beefy um let me get this flat i had a, i was playing this a bunch a couple days ago <laughs> I mean, there's there's a ton of beef to them. They're awesome. Yeah. Sometimes people get all like, you know, oh, Seymour Duncan's a big company. It's like, dude, they still, they make great, great, consistent pickups. Same with PMG. There, yeah, there's a reason they're a big company. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. There's dude. a like, reason oh, they're a big company. They sold out. They're a big company. Oh. They're like actually feeding their families now. And it's like, uh, yeah, that's kind of a good thing. They're, they're not working for poverty wages. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's like, they're not just trying, please take my pickups. Please, somebody buy them, you know? Right. No, it's, it's awesome. I, I admire companies that, and people that, you know, it's one thing if you, this is going to sound really bad. It's one thing if you like, 
quote, sell out by like cutting all your costs, driving your prices way up and then trying to screw your, your customer base. That's one yeah. thing. But when you just start getting more notoriety and you're keeping your quality level up and you're doing more, you know, making more stuff and people, more and more musicians are appreciating what you do. Yeah. Why would there any, why would there ever be anything wrong with that? I think that it's, yeah. you know, it comes from a, a place of like, I don't know, some jealousy or some weird thing. People get like, oh, they're not boutique anymore. I'm like, dude, trust me when I say I have many conversations with the Seymour Duncan team and like they are every bit as boutique as they were. They can afford yeah. better tooling and they yeah. can make it more, you know, they, they can afford maybe a few more staff people to be able to yeah. make a few more than I think people also they they think of like the big companies as being a lot bigger than they are, you True. know, uh, you look at in the effects world, like you look at a, a company like boss, which is arguably the biggest effects company yeah. on the planet. And they, people think boss is hundreds of people. No, no boss is like maybe dozens. Yeah. Maybe. You know they're what I mean? Not, they're not like some massive, massive company. And that's, what's so cool about the music industry, by the way, like there's a lot of, a lot of musical instrument companies, pedal manufacturers, guitar makers, bass makers, microphone companies, a lot of these companies are actually small. They're smaller companies. They're, yeah. they're people that were, that are musicians. And, you know, of course there's the big, big, big corporate companies. And that's, I'm not going to even mention those companies. because pe We all know who those companies are right. and they have their range. We, we know the three or four you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And even then it's like, those guys are filling a need. Like, I don't want to make a $400 super, super, super inexpensive, um, you know, model guitar. Like, it's just, I don't right. want to do that. Um, because I, I want to make sure that anything that we make, it's like, we have total, total quality control on that thing. So I don't throw shade at, big company yeah uh for for doing that like you know i hope that they're treating those people correctly and i really hope that the working conditions are are great uh in the whatever country that they're being manufactured that's honestly a, a big right. concern of mine that's it's one reasons why that we don't do import i can't tell you how many phone calls emails messages i've received uh, and that i receive weekly from manufacturers around the world i probably get two emails a week literally probably two emails a week from yeah. different manufacturers saying hey we love your stuff we'd love to you know help you with uh making a uh, line for import that you can sell for less expensive and meet more you know more consumers and this and that you know if i was just thinking dollars and cents it'd make total sense to do it oh, like you would totally like, do it in a heartbeat if it was dude, just money yeah if it was just money and that was it it's like of course dude like I mean, you could literally make a similar looking instrument. That's very, very important. Very similar looking instrument for far less money. And I could sell it for two grand instead of, you know, five or six yeah, right. or 48 or whatever. Um, but I look at that, like I, I had a person come in my showroom probably a year ago now. He came in and grabbed an instrument off the wall, played He's like, oh my gosh, man. It's perfect. It's amazing. It's so great. And he goes, if this was, if this was like two grand, I would buy it now, like right now. And I was like, <laughs> totally dude, me too. And he laughed and he's like, oh, yeah. what? And, and I'm like, let me ask you a question. And he goes, what? I go, L let's say you walked into the back of my shop and instead of seeing guys laughing and happy and everyone great bench size and, you know, distributed evenly and guys are like, proud to do what they're doing. They're spending the time filing a, a nut down and making it look pretty and whatever. Instead of that, you saw 25 people on a single table, you know, opposite sides and just tick, 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 tick next. Tick, 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 tick. I was like, would you still want to pay two grand for that base? And he's like, I didn't even think about it like that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, exactly. you see the, the fans and the, the sweating faces and the, the whatever conditions. I'm like, just because you don't see that happening, does not mean that isn't exactly what's happening. 
And I'm like, I'm not saying it is, I don't know the working conditions in those areas, but I do know that it isn't regulated. Like how I can walk in the back of my shop and go, the ACs doesn't seem like it's working. Like that's messed up. I better call my dude and make sure it gets cool back there or whatever. All the, you know, my first aid stuff is here for when somebody has a boo-boo and they're using a rasp and it like grinds a little chunk of their skin off. Like all that or, stuff. Oh, there's, there's clean drinking water coming out of the faucet you know, <laughs> or the water fountain or who to thunk, man. Yeah. And there's a coffee espresso machine where we can get wonderful, <laughs> this beautiful drug that we all, that we all love. Um, but it's, it's, uh, so, and he, he like looked at it and he went, Oh my gosh, I've never even thought about it like that. I'm like, you know, that's all I'm saying. And that's why, like, you know, I pay my guys a great wage. You know, it's, it's never going to be bottles and models money in the guitar business. It's no. not what it is, but like, I want people like I have employees that have home, like they've bought houses. They're, they're raising families. They're, they're, you know, living good lives and not just totally like, you know, being paid crap. And, uh, yeah. and he looked at me and he's like, I'll take it. And I was like, well, dude, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, you know, <laughs> you know, make you feel guilty or whatever. And he's like, no, 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 it's, you're right though. Like that's what went into this. It's that's yep. what went into it. And that's why it's the price that it is. And he bought it. It was not an expensive instrument, but so that's one of the main reasons why we don't do the import line is I can't perfectly guarantee that the quality is going to be the same. And I can't perfectly guarantee that the employees over in that other area are going to love doing what they do and really go the extra mile on the instrument. So it's, you know, if you pay somebody dirt to make something that's great, chances are it's probably not going to be as great as you might want it to be, you know? Yeah. So hopefully it doesn't well, throw shade on companies. But. Well, no, not throwing shade. It's just that's, that's your principle. That's your core value for your company. And it's a good core value because, you know, it's another thing. You pay you pay crap wages. Yeah, you're going to get you're going to get work from these staff. But you know what they're also doing at the same time they're doing this work for you? They're looking for another job. Totally. They're, they're constantly looking for something else to make more money to do something else. Therefore, you're going to have turnover in your shop. You're yep. going to have retraining all the time. It's going to slow production times. It's going to reduce quality. And so when you pay people well, you keep them there. That means that that quality of your instrument stays consistent because you've got the oh, same yeah. people. No, I mean, I, it's, it's so true. And I, uh, you know, we just hired a, a new um, person to help in our, in our sanding and uh, prepping for paint kind of de uh, department. And, uh, and by the way, I say department, like some corporate lingo, like <laughs> I seven employees, including myself, like right. it is not a big company, right? Very flat. I'm not like some boss figure that walks in and is like, get your quotas done. Like that's not the vibe here at all. We're all very much, it's a family business. I consider everybody as part of the family. And that's true. I know that sounds like a Hallmark card, but it really is true. And, um, you know, we just hired, you know, new guy, uh, named Julian, who's wonderful, wonderful dude. And, uh, he just started, and I told him, I'm like, the idea here isn't that this is a way station or right. some, you know, like, cool, you're going to be sanding for the rest of your life. And, uh, you're going to be at this price point, you know, pay scale for the rest of your life. It's like, you get better at it and better at it. You take on more responsibilities and this becomes your career. Like we are, we want to be a career driven company. Like somebody that comes on board is with us for a long time. Cause I'll tell you it, turnover and having to deal with people that are not happy with their working conditions, um, which by the way, 99% of the time is on the responsibility of the boss and the person Absolutely at the top is. of the company. It's, it's easy to blame other people, but, if there's a problem in your company and with your working conditions, it's your responsibility as your company. I've heard a, there's a, as, as someone who, you know, hires and supervise has supervised staff for, I don't know, I've been in a supervisory position of some kind for 50, over 15 years now in, in different <laughs> so fields. So you know. And yeah, people, and I've always heard this quote, I was told this, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. True. It's 100% true. They don't quit the job, they quit the boss. And it's, it's true because a lot of, you know, once you get up to a certain level of, I don't even know what it is, like control or 
pay or whatever, like, and you disassociate yourself from your team or from people that are quote unquote junior to you or whatever on the, you know, the chart, whatever the, the hierarchy, I don't even know what to call it. Like it starts, you, you, you can't, you're out of touch. You can't like really do anything. That's like, I don't know for me. I, I think, like I make it a point really that I like I'm not better than anybody else around here, Even, including my my you know musicians that uh, that or people that want to purchase from me or have a build done. Like you know we have our our specs and we have our hardcore like this is what we like to build, um, right? And our options and and whatever like our recipe, but I don't believe myself to be like. That's why, like, I, I don't know, like, it sounds so stupid, but even on social media, like, I'll respond. I like responding to people's comments and thanking people and, like, liking a comment and getting a DM and being like, hey, thank you so much, dude, because I truly feel that way. And if someone sends me a message like, dude, that guitar is sick, bro, and I, I can hear it, like, phonetically as I'm reading the comment, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, dude, thank you, man. Like, what, you know, and there's totally companies out there that you look on their social media and they'll have... 45 comments of like, gosh, I wish to own one of these one day. Oh my gosh, I love this. This is the best thing ever. And it's like, no response from the company. Yeah. I'm like, dude, say something. Even if it's just like pressing the like button, it takes half an like half of a half of a second to do it. You know? So anyway, that's... It that's yeah, and there. it's super easy and we're not asking you to spend your whole day on social media but no just interact a little bit and i've actually been having this conversation over in my podcast discord with with some listeners over in the discord yeah. um that uh, you know i'm 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 one of those that works a full-time job and does music as often as he can right. um and i've 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 flipped, I've bought and sold instruments. And, you know, you do that thing where you found something at a great deal, you play it for a little while, then you're like, okay, now I want to upgrade. So I'm going to sell it, add a little cash, buy something right. else. And you do that over and over again for 23 years. You end up with a lot of gear. i um, just telling you, especially if you're not good at, like I get attached to things. And so we suddenly, all suffer okay, from the same sickness, bro. Yeah. It's okay. You're, <laughs> you're, now, you're now the permanent part of the collection because I'm attached to you. Yeah. But there's a part of me that's like, talking about this whole relationship with a company yeah there's a part of me that's like i i still have guitars by the big companies no, by, by two of the big companies but yeah. there's a part of me that's like i i kind of like i have this itch i haven't done it yet i haven't because there's reasons but where i'm like i kind of just want to get rid of those and only own guitars by companies or instruments or things where I feel connected to those companies, like, for example, um, you know, I have I have a cower. I I yeah. met Doug. I know Doug Cower, and yeah. I, I like having Great something dude. he built. Pedals, pedals on the wall here. Like, I have pedals that I know the person who built that. You know what yeah, I mean? Like that's, that's so it, I'm attached to that. It's and so cool. Whereas like the big companies, I don't know who put this guitar together. I don't know who yeah. built it. I don't know that person. You know, I can't point to this person who has shown and it's this is this is total mental gymnastics and like <laughs> sentimentality that has nothing to do zero to do with the quality of the instrument there's right. a thing where you're like i know that the person who built this instrument or this pedal or this amp or this whatever is a good person and i yeah. like this person and i want to support them yeah. you know what i mean it's true though it's, like like that's w with anything in life like that's you know, you buy a, a house with a realtor that you like, you might not yeah. even freaking love the house. Like as stupid as that sounds like there are, that's how people live their lives. Like it is mm -hmm. all And This really does sound like a Hallmark card that what I'm about to say, but I remember my dad used to tell me like, he's like, Spence, it's all about relationships. Everything is about relationships. He's like your vendors that you're buying from, you know, like, it's no, it's no secret. Like we use, um, well, I won't, I was going to say something. We use a, a different person who's a super, super amazing, amazing finisher for, for our uh, finishing on our instruments. Yeah. Um, and occasionally 
sometimes something will come back and it's like, oh, I, I need to, we need to buff this a little bit more or we need to blah a little bit, whatever. Like, and there's almost always like, we do our own spin after something's finished and comes back to us that, you know, we do for all of our instruments. It's our own kind of secret sauce and stuff that we do. But am I going to then go call that person and be like, hey, just so you know, um, on the top upper left bit of the right horn, like there was a little spot that it could have been buffed a little, like, <laughs> no. bro, like I would hate that. I would hate to yeah. get that call. I'd be like, really? Was it a problem? Did it take you three seconds? Like, you know, so anyways, the reason I even say that is like, he, my dad used to tell me all the time. He's like, it is about relationships. And, um, I'll give you a really quick, really quick, funny story. Um, there was, I was like 13, 14 and I was in the shop so my, at my dad's bench was Saturday and I'm sitting there, uh, just, I think I was doing homework or something like that. Or I just got back from the skate park or something. And he, uh, he's out in the front with customers, the front of the shop. And there's like five people all in a line to, you know, either drop a guitar off or there was getting some service on one of their lows or something like that. There was just five people in a line. That's all I remember being 14 and not really paying attention. And then a person walks in. And I didn't know who they were at the time. Um, and they had like four or five instruments with them. And they sat behind the line. Hey, Mike, you know, hey, good to see you. Hey, hey how's it going? And uh, takes about an hour to get to that person, like th through all those people, right? And he leaves and my dad walks back and there's nobody else in line. And, you know, I'm like, who was that? And he goes, oh, that's, uh, that's, you know, I won't mention their name here, but that person who's a, uh, you know, Pearl Jam's, uh, you know, equipment manager. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> but that's like, that's, those are Pearl Jam's guitars. He's like, yeah, it was just, I mean, a, a couple of them. And he's, I'm like, why didn't you have him go to the front of the line? And he goes, he got here last. <laughs> like there was no, like, there was no like, oh, he's a, like, there's like this celebrity thing or whatever. And the other individual who's a dear friend, by the way, that's why I'm not saying his name. Um, yeah, yeah. didn't have anything, uh, to say. There was no complaint. There was, he knew he's like, Hey, I'm, I'm here, you know, next yeah. uh, I'm, I'm in line. And right after th that whole thing happened, my dad looked at me all kind of confused. He goes, Spence, nobody is more important than anybody else. And he's like, the, all those guys are paying my bills, not just that guy. And I was like, that's exactly right. Okay. And at the time it really stuck. Like it, it stuck in, in my head and it's, it's so true. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love my professional musicians. I like awesome, awesome people and, uh, great relationships with a lot of, a lot of awesome, awesome musicians, but it's everybody's important in their own right. You know, anybody who wants one of our instruments, anyone who just wants to talk about our instruments, I'm like, that person's important. So I don't know. I think it, it's a little bit of an old school mentality, but I do like talking with everybody. I do like, you know, understanding what makes people tick and why they'd want to own one of our instruments. I've, I've put more hours talking to people who haven't bought an instrument from me and might not ever buy something from me, but like love talking instruments and we're always specking out that custom build. And I'm like, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Like, <laughs> and it's like next month and I'm like, cool. And I, I don't care. I'm not like, Oh, this person, like I spent an hour with them and they're never going to buy like stupid, man. Like, it's not about yeah. that. It's about like, and then I have guys that come in like, yeah, just build me a, you know, an M4V like that orange one, right. Modern four uh -huh. vintage base. They're like, Build me M4V uh, in candy apple orange. And it's like, okay, like same specs as our standard. Yeah, just what you guys normally do. And I'm like, great. It takes three minutes and deposit <laughs> is in. And it's like, cool, let's start, you know? So it's, it all works out in the end. I think it's, it really is about people. It's about people yeah. and it's about relationships and trying to make uh, the best possible instruments that we, that we can and keeping that integrity there. Cause there are so many things we could do to lessen the value of our instruments and bring prices down, you know, and they would result in an instrument that is not something that's one of our instruments, you know? Yeah. So, 
No, makes total sense. Yeah. Anyways, there's a long-winded answer to whatever we were even <laughs> with a question. But yeah. No, man. Well, no, it makes it makes sense, and that it, the relationship industry is what we're you know it, oh, it's yes, a relationship yes, yes, thing. Yes. It's you build a great product, you be good people. <laughs> and you treat people fairly, and you're gonna be successful. You put that positivity out there, you're gonna get it back. I, and, I and tr- it, truly believe that. You I, gotta I start totally obviously agree. with a quality product. I mean, that's that's number one. You gotta have yeah. You, you can't have polish the thing people want so much. You know, there's there's a little yeah. you can do, but uh, yeah. no, I, I agree. And I think you know, like grab one of these guitars here. Let's see if we can. In fact, this is the only guitar that I have in right now. This is a. Uh, this is a TLTX, which stands for Tim Lurch TX. Our uh-huh. RTX is our Telecaster style instrument. I will say at that time, if, I, hopefully everyone knows what a <laughs> Telecaster is. Um, yeah. And you know this this instrument is actually uh, it's semi hollow. It's a little bit thicker than a standard Telecaster uh-huh. body, um, and it's hollow chamber on the full you know right and left sides, full hollow chambers, and then a solid block down the middle. Uh, no echoes, and it's got a little bit chunkier neck profile to it for the guys that love uh, the chunky necks. Um, yeah, that, that's me. That's me. Yeah, see, I I have total mood swings on it. I love kind of even necks, not thin, but like kind of medium esque kind of necks. And then mm-hmm. some days I'll play a chunky neck, and I'm like, yeah, this is the only thing I ever want to hold. And then other days I'll hold a chunky neck, and I'm like what give me something that i can like i can thumb a little bit easier you know <laughs> um so like he you know tim lurch is is very much a super proficient jazz and blues uh musician so that thick neck also does do a do a thing for tone as well it's not yes. just the feel um there's generally a, a larger bass response to a chunkier neck um the thinner the neck, you start kind of taking out a little bit of low end. It's not, okay, I, I'm going to get in trouble with anything I say. It's like, it's going to be like a hard bound rule. But oh, yeah. uh, the thicker the neck, generally the, the kind of meatier <laughs> it can sound like, you know, um, which is a cool thing. And then for some applications, it's not a cool thing. And you need a little bit yeah. thinner neck. Um, you know, I, I find that the mid's kind of beefing up with a, with a really chunky neck. Um, sometimes people want a scoop and they don't want that super thick mid range kind of sound. Um, yeah, could you, like, could you imagine a, like a shred guitar with a chunky neck with that mid response? No, never would work. It's no. never, but I mean, you get something like this, like, I only play the wrong notes. <laughs> right? What's the <laughs> thing that uh, Victor Wooten says? He's like, there's no wrong notes, man. And even if you do hit a, quote, wrong note, you're just half a step away from the right note. Yeah, that's it. I had a, uh, I had a jazz professor in college. I, w- I went to undergrad for music. Oh, nice. And I had, my, I had a jazz professor who once said, and I'm going to try to emulate his uh, delivery. In jazz, there are no wrong notes, only bad decisions. <laughs> and what he meant is... He meant is the wrong the note is only wrong if what you do after makes it wrong. Dude. Like no notes wrong until the next thing you do. All you gotta do is play the note again like shortly afterwards to let people know that you meant to play that note. <laughs> you know? It's Repetition like Repetition gives legitimacy. It's like that You're like, oh, that's the wrong note. But then you Like, oh, there's, yeah. whoa, there's some like, woo, he's adding a flat third in there for like, why? Oh, there's I, a, there was a, there was a great story and, and we'll wrap up on this and then we'll head over to the Patreon episode for Patreon supporters. Again, if you are interested in getting extra content every week, well, when I don't have COVID, 
uh, every week. You can hop <laughs> over to Patreon uh, episode and you can get extra content for just five bucks a month. Uh, or if you don't want the extra content, but you do want to get this episode without the ads, maybe you noticed if you're a longtime listener, there's a, a pre-roll and there's going to start to maybe be a mid-roll ad. Uh, Got to pay for the podcast somehow. You know how it is. Um, if you want to get that at the episodes without the ads, you can do so for three dollars a month over the Patreon and you will get the episodes ad free. Uh, but there's this great story. Um I heard once of Martina McBride, and and for those of you that are not hip to country, especially '90s and early 2000s country, that's fine. Killers. Martina McBride, oh yeah, she is Ooh. one of the most talented singers that I've yeah. ever heard. Well, she said, I I don't know what song it was. I saw the video, but it it, it was one of those big like dramatic belting songs that she does, right? And she which she's so known for, and there's this high note to end the song, and she's it's live. And she goes to hit that note, and she's flat, like almost a half half step flat, and <sighs> and she hits it, and instead of quickly correcting and making the mistake more obvious than it was, she held it, and she held that flat note for must have been two bars, three oh. bars. And then bent it into the right note and slurred right. it into the right note. And I was like, that's, and it made it work. I was like, that is jazz. <laughs> and you're like, it's also Martina McBride. Like, <laughs> yeah, geez, exactly. How do you even sound that good? That's not from Earth, I guess, you know? Oh, yeah. It, Martina McBride singing the wrong notes is still better than a lot of people singing the right notes. It's so. a lot better than me <laughs> trying to hit that note. I'll tell you that, man. Um, For sure. No, but I mean, dude, it's. For us, you know, we just, we try to have fun and we try to make the best instruments that we possibly can. And um, my dad was a bass player. So kind of as a, it just kind of happened naturally that the bass has got a lot of attention. Uh, sure. The guitars, you know, are, are getting a lot more now. But for the time that my dad was around, it, it's not that they, that they, it's never that they were bad or that whatever. It's just, he was a bass player. Talked basses all the time. Whenever the subject came up, it was like bass, 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 bass. And then he'd be like, well, I also make guitars. And then people would <laughs> be like, oh, wow. Or he'd be at NAMM or something. And someone would go, you make guitars? And they go play and go, holy crap. Like, whoa. What? Yeah. You make guitars as good as you make your basses. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of like we aim to please in both areas. So we have like our SX, which is our <coughs> Strat style instrument. We have our TX, which is our Tele style instrument. Um, and then we have the, the TLTX, which is the Tim Lurch TX, which is what I'm, I'm playing right now, which is a very thick kind of airy, you know, sounding guitar. It's like it borrows some stuff from a, from a Telecaster, but also even some stuff from like a 335 and like a Les Paul kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's this hybrid of just thick kind of airy tones that play really well clean. And then also... You can overdrive the crap out of them. Like these are a Fralin <laughs> uh, humbucker sized P90s in this one. Wow. And again, we absolutely love Lindy. Uh, his stuff is incredible. His whole team is awesome. And we get paid nothing to say that. That's just, we love his stuff. Um, yeah. And he's also just a total guru. Like for anybody who's ever maybe looked into buying a set of his pickups or something, <laughs> like you can straight up call Fralin, you know, pickups and, there's a chance that you're just going to chat with Lindy yourself if you if you call him. And he'll chat yeah. with you about anything. He's like, oh, that'd be really cool to do like a set of those pickups. With that. He's totally, very same thing, like very into it. And not just trying to make a buck, but making a really great quality set of pickups that are going to fit whatever that person's trying to achieve. So, you know, Spencer Lull here for Fralin Pickups. Uh, no, but <laughs> it's... it's <laughs> So in the in the description below, you'll see you'll find links for Fralin pickup. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, so, right. right. <laughs> so y'all, um, look at the links below. You're gonna find links for all of the Michael uh, Spencer stuff. You're gonna find Instagram website. Go check them out. Um, it. Do y'all have a YouTube channel? Do you have a YouTube channel? We, so we just started revamping it. Yeah, Mike Lowell Custom okay. Guitars. I have like maybe six new demos on there. And I think we have a okay. whopping like hundred subscribers, so it's it's wonderful. Um, oh, awesome! But it's 
we're going to start really posting on the regularly. I aim to post more long form kind of content. Um, yeah. And I post a ton on Instagram and Facebook, our website. Yeah. Uh, I'm constantly updating it. If anyone wants to know like about, you know, what do they make? What kind of instruments do they make? You know, uh, sound bits, sound demos, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty much all on our Instagram and Facebook. So Perfect. a big point that we try to make is every instrument that we build for stock or even, even some custom orders, we try to do a demo of everything. And sometimes things get crazy and we can't do a demo or like what's been happening a lot for the last four or five months, even longer than that is I can't even keep stock in the showroom. So what'll happen is like, okay, we're going to do a demo on that one. And then it's gone before I can even post that it's available. Like I'll get somebody that right. calls in is like, Hey, yo, I need a four string jazz active four string jazz. And I'm like, well, we just finished up this one, uh, but I haven't listed it yet. And they're like, okay, I'll take it. I'm like, great. <laughs> like, which is awesome. It's a great problem to have. And I, I love it. It's, it's fantastic. But then I go, and get to do a demo of that but there's yeah. plenty plenty of sound bits and honest true not super compressed guitar demos bass demos um all on our instagram or facebook and then soon we have like seven or eight on our on our youtube but soon i'm we have like a ton of content i'm just gonna like post a ton of stuff i don't care about the strategy of like trying to build up subscribers by oh, posting here you have, and there, you have but, to post at 8 30 a.m on yeah, the second tuesday of a full moon in order to yeah, get yeah. maximum reach in the algorithm you must have <laughs> oh at least gosh. these exact three tags for your industry I don't <laughs> for me yeah, it's okay. uh you know like i i use stuff that i know how to use and i'm actually not a super tech savvy person i know i'm yeah. like in that generation where i should be but I'm very much like not. And, <laughs> and, and I, and I am tech savvy uh, ish, but it's like the YouTube thing is weird for me. Like, um, like I've started doing demos on the YouTube and some other stuff. I've had some companies contact me and, and I'm still small. I'm still like right. 300 something subscribers on YouTube, but that's because I know I do a long form video podcast. Yeah. Like, I, and I, the only reason I started posting the video was because I started using a platform that gave me video. I was like, well, I may as well use it, right? And right. put it on YouTube. But YouTube doesn't like our plus content. <laughs> so it's like it doesn't push it. So eventually it'll catch on. The demos will catch on more as I'm doing more. It's fine. Don't right. don't rush and it. It'll all work out. Try just, just try posting the hour long things on TikTok, man. You know, it'll, yeah. be, it'll be great. Uh, that's, nice. I actually have a, I have way more followers on TikTok than I have on YouTube. Really? So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. We oh, just yeah. started doing the TikTok too. It's like, we're like, hey, we should probably start a TikTok. Because I remember when I was like 16 and Instagram first started being a thing, I told my dad, I was like maybe 17 or 18. I told my dad, I'm like, you got to get on Instagram. Like you have to get yeah. on Instagram. And he's like, Instajam, like, what are you talking about? Man? <laughs> and um uh, I'm like, no, no, it's these photos. Listen, it's these photos. And um, we started doing it and really pushing it hard uh, a few years ago, kind of when I came on board, fully came on board. I grew up in the shop. I've always been here. Um, but my dad specifically wanted me to go get experience in other endeavors, um, you know, specifically to be able to bring stuff back to the business. And yeah, makes sense. It's a. Uh, but yeah, once we started doing that, I mean, it was a total game changer for us. So now, like, we, we do a lot on Instagram, a lot of a lot on Facebook. We have good followings there. And then I was like, you know, I really think uh, it's smart to have a presence on TikTok. And that's where another set of musicians are that are real musicians and real people, just like everybody, every other platform. Um, yeah. And same with YouTube. So there's, there's no shortage of people uh, on this, you know on any social media platform. And uh, so it's like, why not? Why not try? And so we're still figuring those out, the YouTube and the yeah. uh, and the TikTok, but you know. Yeah, me too. too, me too. Soon. Well, all right, well, we're gonna wrap up here and we're gonna head over to uh, Patreon. Spencer, thank you for joining me for this episode. Hope Absolutely. everybody enjoyed it. Um, uh, but in the meantime, remember, go check out, click all the links below. 
you, you'll find links to uh, all of the ways you can support the podcast, all of the Mike Love, Mike Lowell custom guitar stuff. And until I see you or talk to you next time, remember to uh, be kind to yourselves, be good to each other, and try to make some noise. <laughs>